For Christmas years ago, my older sister bought me a camera. Now, this was back in the dark ages when you actually needed film for a camera. Do some of you remember those days? Well, I became very interested in photography and, in fact, uh, became fascinated with one photographer in particular. Uh, his name is Ansel Adams, and he was an uh, American landscape photographer, and he took photos of the American West. Uh, but what, what was unique about his photography is that he did it in black and white. His photography is iconic, and he once said, Ansel Adams once said, you don't just take a photo, you make a photo. Nevermore was this more true than the 2014 Academy Awards. There was a photo taken at that award ceremony that went viral. It became known as the Ellen Selfie. It was taken by the host, Ellen DeGeneres. This was a, a selfie that I'll show you, uh, just to remind you of it in case you happen to miss it. But originally, Ellen was walking through the audience, and the plan was that she was going to take a selfie with Meryl Streep. Well, once she kneeled down to take this selfie, uh, several other celebrities and A-list actors happened to pop into the photo, including Bradley Cooper, who took the photo, Julia Roberts, Brad Pitt, the A-list, the who's who of actors. Ellen declared right before the photo was taken that she wanted to make that photo the most retweeted thing ever on the social media engine Twitter. And so within 45 minutes, that photo was retweeted 750,000 times. And to this day, it's been retweeted about three and a half million times. In fact, she did hold for a little more than three years the title of the most retweeted tweet until a teenager from Nevada uh, sent out a plea for free chicken nuggets from the fast food chain Wendy's, and that went viral. And that is now the most retweeted tweet. But there's something powerful, isn't there, about capturing an image that means something and sharing it with others. Well, if the Oscars is Hollywood's biggest night, then Christmas Eve is Jesus' biggest night. Tonight, People around the world, more people than any other day of the year, will worship him, will, will come to a church to pay homage, to, to worship the sent Savior. As if we were taking a group selfie, it's an opportunity for us all to lean in and to look closer at this ancient story. Because I think there's a part of each of us that decide, desires to see this Christ, this infant Savior and Redeemer up close. That's true of our daughter Hadley, who has recently been asking me, Daddy, when am I going to see Jesus? I've heard so much about Jesus. When am I actually going to see him? Now, even as a pastor, I have struggled to answer this question, truth be told. But uh, my wife, Sarah, discovered there, there was going to be a live nativity uh, nearby here in Wheaton a few weeks ago. She was going to be out of town, but she set it up, and I thought, perfect, this will be Hadley's opportunity to see Jesus up close. So we arrived. Uh, the unfortunate thing was this live nativity was, was a bit rained out. There were no live animals, and it had to be held indoors. Uh, it was mobbed at that point, and the only seats available were in the very back, but we set ourselves up, and we had what we thought was going to be a, a pathway to be able to see, to be able to focus in on the scene up front, where there were songs and music, and they began telling the nativity story, and then the moment came the Holy Family started to arrive into the building. They walked up onto the stage, and I said, Hadley, this is it. Jesus is here. Look, and she stood up on her chair, and she looked in, 
And then she had a, a very disturbed look on her face, and she leaned over to me, and she said, but I want to see his face. And I thought, well, this is as good as it gets, because we're not getting any closer tonight. I thought it was a win. We were just going to nail this seeing Jesus up close thing. But in fact, she left only wanting to see Jesus even more. That night as I was putting her to bed, you know, wanting to console her and reaffirm her, I said, well, you know, Hadley, Jesus is always with you. He is always in your heart. And she kind of shook her head and looked back at me and she said, is he squished in there? <laughs> A very literal interpretation of my pastoral parenting moment with her. But tonight, we're all going to lean in. We're all going to gather around this story. We're all going to get in the frame. The lens is going to focus in for us on a story we've heard before, a story we know, but maybe tonight there's a detail that'll mean something to you that you haven't caught before. So we're going to read together from the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. You can follow the scripture on the screen or in a Bible as we read together. Luke tells us that nearby shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. The Lord's angels stood before them. The Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. The angels said, don't be afraid. Look, I bring good news to you, wonderful joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. This is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel, praising God. They said, glory to God in heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go right now to Bethlehem and see what's happened. Let's confirm what the Lord has revealed to us. They went quickly and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw this, they reported what they had been told about this child. Everyone who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds told them. Mary committed these things to memory and considered them carefully. The shepherds returned home, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Everything happened just as they had been told. The word of the Lord. It's an interesting detail that the news of the Savior's arrival was shared with these shepherds. If you wanted a message to go viral, the shepherds were the least likely candidates to be able to accomplish this. They were the lowest on the social ladder. They were not significant people. They were not celebrities. They were not going to be people by whom this message would be shared far and wide. What's with the shepherds? What's interesting is that one of the ways that Jesus was, would phrase his ministry with us was through the language of shepherding. In fact, the most defining image of Jesus in the Gospels is that of a shepherd. The lowliest of the low, an overlooked group of professionals. And yet, this great news was revealed to them. The angel shows up and doesn't give them any proof he doesn't scroll through his uh, series of Instagram photos of the nativity scene. There's no actual proof that this has happened, but he says, 
Here's a clue. If you go to David's city, if you go to Bethlehem, you'll see the Savior as a child, wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. And just then, there was a heavenly, angelic, pyrotechnic experience, and it's as if all of heaven descended upon that field and expressed great praise to God. It must have been a sight to behold. The angels said, glory to God. And the shepherds said, did that really just happen? They didn't even have time to grab their shepherd selfie staff. They actually invented that, if you didn't know. They were experiencing the news that no one had ever heard. They were hearing it for the very first time. We don't know exactly what it would have been like, but what we do know is this. What the shepherds saw lying in that manger was a picture of heaven itself. About a year ago, the Pew Research Center did a survey leading up to Christmas, and they listed four details of the Christmas story and asked people, in comparison to the survey they did did a few years before, how strongly participants believe in those details, one of which was the account that we read tonight that the story or the news of Jesus' arrival was shared with these shepherds in a field. What the survey revealed was there was a bit of a growing skepticism among those who took the survey, both for those who are religiously unaffiliated, who several years ago, 31% said they believed that detail, but a year ago, only 20%. What's also interesting is that was true among Christians who 90% reported belief in that detail, but then only 86% several years later. Why might that be? Could it be that this is just a little too hard to imagine? The odds too great to fathom? What we know is that surveys aren't exactly an exact science, but I'm amazed when looking further into the, revol- the results of it that an overwhelming majority of non-Christians, those who don't belong to any particular faith group, the, the great majority still celebrate Christmas. Could it be that people long to believe in the truth of the story but yet struggle to make sense of it with their rational minds. And if that's you, I I totally get it. I, I resonate with the struggle to believe in something miraculous. I completely do. But I would also say that the truth is you probably haven't watched enough Cubs baseball games. (laughs) August 12th, earlier this year, It was the bottom of the ninth inning. The Cubs were playing uh, the Washington Nationals. They were down by three runs. There were two outs. And they decide to send a pinch hitter into the game at this very crucial moment. They sent David Bodie into the game. And... This is what uh, Little League players dream of as kids. This is the moment you're practicing in your backyard for hours. And this is what happened. Ahead of these Cubs hitters. He needs that strike three pitch or that put away pitch to get that third out.
for any baseball player, that's about as good as it gets. An impossible scenario. An unprecedented win. Not long after that win, this photo was posted to Twitter. It was actually retweeted, and the caption of the person who tweeted it said this, I collect images of walk-off home runs as the player is rounding third base because it's a picture of heaven. We can see the, sir, the third base coach with his arms open wide. We can see the players with the red shirts on. Those are the, the pitchers who didn't even play that night but have run all the way from the bullpen to be part of the celebration. We can see the rest of the team just waiting for him to step on home plate to continue to celebrate together. You can even see the fans in the background, many of whom don't even know each other, and yet they're high-fiving one another, hugging one another, erupting in applause and joy. That is the essence of what it means to celebrate as a human. I think baseball, baseball in many ways is a metaphor for life itself. We start off in the dugout with our families. We step up to home plate by ourselves, making a life of our own. And then we see how far we can get along the bases of life, walking, running that baseline. And eventually, we round third base and we can see home. We return home to be with those who have loved us, who know us. And Jesus stands behind home plate with his arms open wide, ready to welcome us. Jesus came long ago. And when he came, he brought heaven down with him. Whatever your perspective on the Christmas story, it's a story worth leaning into and taking a second look. Jesus gave us the clearest picture of heaven this side of eternity. Amen.